Hello historians and welcome back. Today we will be looking at the early life of good Queen Bess, also known as Queen Elizabeth I. Elizabeth was born on the 7th of September 1533 at Greenwich Palace to King Henry VIII and his second wife and queen, Queen Anne Boleyn. The Princess Elizabeth was the couple's first and only surviving child, although at this point Henry had two illegitimate children, the Lady Mary and Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond and Somerset. Unlike when her sister was born, Elizabeth's arrival was a disappointment for both of her parents. The celebrations at court were muted, very cold and disagreeable, and there had been no thought of having the bonfires and rejoicings usual in such cases, according to the imperial ambassador Eustace Shapwee. Henry's enemies believed that the birth of a daughter was divine punishment for the king's controversial divorce from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. The birth of the Princess Elizabeth meant that the Princess Mary was now illegitimate and was now to be referred to as the Lady Mary. Elizabeth was christened three days later on the 10th. Elizabeth was Henry's heir, but she was not a welcomed one. The Dowager Duchess of Norfolk helped carry the canopy of estate and Elizabeth was wrapped in a mantle of purple velvet with a long train. Mary Howard carried a chrism of pearl and stone to put on the child at baptism. Anne quickly conceived a deep and protective love for her child, as any mother would do, and to begin with, hated to let her out of her sight. By her throne under the canopy of estate lay her baby on a velvet cushion. Anne feared that Mary posed a threat to Elizabeth's position. Henry soothed Anne's fears by separating Mary from many of her servants and eventually disbanded her household. In the December, plague had hit London, so Henry sent Mary and Elizabeth to Hatfield House, where the country air was better for the baby and would become a favourite home for the young princess. Mary was to be a maid of honour for her half-sister against her wishes. Anne often visited her daughter at Eltham or Hatfield and Henry was also proud of his red-haired daughter and liked showing her off to visiting ambassadors. Anne was delighted in July 1535 as King Francis at last agreed to enter negotiations for the marriage of Elizabeth to his third son. However, to many, Mary was still seen as next in line as not everyone recognised the new marriage, despite being declared illegitimate and Elizabeth named as heir. November 1535, Anne found out she was pregnant again. Anne had suffered miscarriages since Elizabeth, and she had suffered from depression during the first few months as she knew her future was riding on this baby, as Henry was becoming less tolerable of his strong-headed wife and Henry's pursuit of Jane Seymour was pretty obvious. Anne repeatedly pressed Henry to execute Catherine and Lady Mary out of fear for herself, Elizabeth and the unborn child, but Henry would not succumb to Anne's demands. Catherine of Aragon fell dangerously ill. The ironic thing is, despite Anne believing that Catherine was her downfall, Catherine was Anne's safety net. As long as Catherine was around, Anne was safe. Henry would not harm her, as it would prove he was wrong. Catherine of Aragon died on the 7th of January 1536, the same day that Elizabeth's mother, Anne, would miscarry her saviour, as she saw Jane Seymour sat on the king's knee. Two days later, on the 9th, the king and queen held a court ball to celebrate the threat of war dying with Catherine. The royal couple wore yellow, the royal colour of mourning in Spain, out of a sign of respect. Although, it has been argued that this was actually a snub to Catherine, as it was a party, and it involved dancing, and everyone was enjoying life in bright colours, rather than being sombre and wearing black, the English colour of mourning. The Princess Elizabeth was paraded around the room in the arms of her father, who took great pleasure in showing off his child. 
Anne Boleyn spent the early months of 1536 at Greenwich. She rarely saw the king now, and spent her days doing charity work, playing with her dogs, and ordering new clothes. Her accounts show that she kept Elizabeth dressed majestically. The month of May would be the downfall of Anne Boleyn, and feeling that something was amiss, Anne charged her chaplain, Matthew Parker, with the care of Elizabeth on the 26th of April, 1536. Anne was right to do so, as she was executed on the 19th of May, 1536, along with her uncle George on the 17th. Elizabeth's position and safety at court was never certain after Anne's execution. She was demoted from princess to lady, and she wasn't protected, as she was not the heir to the throne, like her brother Edward, nor did she have a powerful family member to protect her, like her half-sister Mary. Elizabeth had to learn to be silent and invisible from a young age, if she planned on surviving. On the next day, the 20th of May, Henry wore white, the royal colour of mourning in France, as this is where Anne pretty much grew up. This to me is also evidence that when they wore yellow for Catherine, it wasn't actually a snub. Henry gave orders for Elizabeth to be taken from Greenwich to Hatfield in the care of Lady Margaret Bryan and kept out of his sight. Elizabeth, like her sister Mary, was deemed illegitimate and was now to use the title the Lady Elizabeth, like her sister, and was not to refer to herself as a princess. Elizabeth would remain a lady until she became queen in 1558. Elizabeth gained her first stepmother on the 30th of May 1536 when her father married Jane Seymour. We don't know when Elizabeth realised what was going on, however the absence of her mother and the appearance of Jane would certainly have been noticeable. It is noted that the once precocious princess asked Sir John Shelton, who was in charge of her household, how hath it yesterday, Lady Princess, and today, but Lady Elizabeth? This shows that she knew something was wrong, and the three-year-old Elizabeth was already demonstrating her infamous intellect. As mentioned in the last video, Elizabeth didn't have a powerful family to look after her, like Mary did. Her father wanted nothing to do with her, and neither did Jane. Initially, she didn't want to be associated with the child of a traitor. So, Mary's maternal side took over. She was the one that looked after her little sister and took an interest in her education. After all, Mary's beef wasn't with Elizabeth. It was with her dead mother, Anne Boleyn. On the 21st of July, 1536, Mary visited Elizabeth at Hatfield and she wrote to their father to say Elizabeth was in good health and in time, he would have good cause to be proud of his youngest daughter. It was thanks to Mary's intervention that at Christmas, Elizabeth was welcomed to court and Henry showed affection to his youngest for the first time since May. The 12th of October, 1537, saw the birth of Elizabeth's brother Edward, and both sisters would take part in the prince's christening. Mary was a godparent, while Elizabeth was carried by her brother's maternal uncle in the procession. She carried the chrism, and once Edward was baptised and named heir, Elizabeth and Mary walked back to the Queen's apartments hand in hand. Their sisterly love at the beginning is so sweet, and it's just so sad when you know how quickly their relation starts to get strained. Elizabeth lost her stepmother on the 24th of October 1537. Her father was heartbroken. After Jane's death, Elizabeth went to Hunston, where she was looked after by Mary, since her governess had been transferred to Prince Edward's household. Elizabeth was brought to court by her sister for the Easter celebrations in 1538. She was four and a half, and even Chapuis described her as being certainly very pretty. Elizabeth became an expert needlewoman and was able to complete a shirt for her brother Edward as a New Year's gift in 1539. And despite her intellect and her achievements, even at a young age, she still failed to get her father's approval. But baby steps were being made as Henry was treating her as his daughter. Although he wasn't exactly father of the year. 
Elizabeth got a new stepmother on the 6th of January 1540 when her father married Anne of Cleves and this marriage would be even shorter than the last one. However, Anne would stay in contact with Elizabeth after the divorce. Elizabeth, who was arguably desperate for a mother figure, wrote to Anne shortly after the wedding, trying to make a good impression. She wanted to come to court and meet her new stepmother. She wrote, Permit me to show by this billet. She wrote in this at the first of her letters to survive. The zeal which I devote my respect to you as queen and my entire obedience to you as my mother. I am too young and feeble to have power to do more than felicitate you with all my heart in this commencement of your marriage. I hope that your majesty will have as much good will for me as I have zeal for your service. Anne was touched and impressed by the now six-year-old Elizabeth and asked Henry if Elizabeth could come to court, but he said no. He took the letter and gave it to Cromwell, and then ordered him to write a reply. Tell her, he said brutally, that she had a mother so different from this woman that she ought not to wish to see her. Henry then divorced Anne of Cleves on the 12th of July, 1540. Boy, that escalated quickly. As mentioned earlier, Anne wanted to stay in touch with Henry's children. Her and Mary were of a similar age, and the two were friends, while Elizabeth was a bright girl who was in need of a mother. Unlike her brother Edward, Elizabeth was not fussed over by governesses and nurses. Anne had no plans to remarry and have children, and Elizabeth could be her child. So Anne asked Henry if she could invite Elizabeth to visit her on occasions, saying that to have had her for her daughter would have been greater happiness to her than being queen. Thanks to Anne's cooperation in annulling the marriage, Henry agreed, and it may be assumed that the Lady Elizabeth would frequent her former stepmother at Richmond Palace. Henry VIII married his fifth wife, Catherine Howard, at Oatlands Palace in Surrey on the 28th of July 1540, and that very same day, he also had his former right-hand man, Thomas Cromwell, executed. This marriage was a glimmer of hope for the Lady Elizabeth, as her new stepmother was a relative. Catherine was first cousins with her mother, Anne Boleyn. Because Catherine Howard was related to Elizabeth, the little princess was given the place of honour at the royal wedding banquet. It was thought that Catherine reminded Henry of Anne Boleyn, but the dismissive version he had hoped for, not the argumentative and ambitious version that he got. Catherine Howard was then executed on the 13th of February 1542 with Elizabeth's auntie, Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford. Elizabeth would get her fourth and final stepmother on the 12th of July 1543 when Catherine Parr married her father in the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court Palace. Catherine, who was on her third marriage, was a seasoned wife and stepmother and it concerned her greatly that all three of her stepchildren lived separately away from court and rarely saw their father. In August 1543, she wrote to all three of them and asked if they would come and visit her and their father at court. The Lady Elizabeth responded promptly and expressed in very eloquent terms her appreciation of Catherine's kindness, which she was sure she did not deserve. She promised that she would conduct herself, that Catherine would never have cause for complaint, and that she would be diligent in showing obedience and respect. I await with much impatience the orders of the king, my father, for the accomplishment of the happiness for which I sigh, and I remain with much submission. Your Majesty's very dear Elizabeth. It wasn't long before both Elizabeth and her sister Mary arrived at court. Henry had never felt comfortable in Elizabeth's company, but with Catherine Parr's influence, he softened towards his daughter, and it seemed, for Elizabeth, that she had finally got the mother that she had been longing for. Elizabeth was nearly ten, and she was already showing signs of inheriting her mother's courage, love of flattery, and her flirty disposition, something that we would see in her reign as queen. It was commented about Elizabeth's intelligence, as we have noted earlier, but also her sharp wit that rivalled any adult. However, 
Elizabeth was not as volatile as her mother had been. Her insecure childhood had taught her the value of discretion and deception, something that her mother had failed to learn. Also like her mother, Elizabeth spoke several languages, which impressed the new queen who decided to supervise Elizabeth's education, seeing the potential in the young lady. On the 7th of February 1544, Elizabeth's father passed a new act of succession. It was clear that he was stuck with the three children that he had, so this new act of succession brought Mary and Elizabeth back in the line of succession, if he or Edward failed to produce children. However, he was still adamant that they were both illegitimate. However, it would not be long before father and daughter's relationship declined again. We don't know what the argument was about, but Elizabeth was banished from court and asked Catherine Parr to step in and talk to her father on her behalf. She had not dared write to her father. She confessed and begged her stepmother to send a letter on her behalf, praying ever for his sweet benediction, and beseeching God to send him victory over his enemies so that your highness and I may soon as possible rejoice in his happy return. Henry had gone off to France on campaign, and absence from his wife had made him all the fonder, and when Catherine wrote again, begging him to forgive Elizabeth for her unknown offence, and receive the child again at court, he relented, and gave his permission for her to go to Greenwich to keep Catherine company. In the new year of 1545, the Lady Elizabeth sent her stepmother her translation of Margaret of Nevers' book, Le Miroir de l'Em Percheresse. I have absolutely butchered that, but we're rolling with it. It was written in a beautiful, fine italic script, and she had obviously taken a lot of care over it. Catherine was already a published author, and it's fair to say that maybe. This is what inspired Elizabeth to do so. Elizabeth begged Catherine not to show anyone else, as it is all imperfect and incorrect. Catherine was deeply moved that Elizabeth had gone to such trouble, and on the first page Elizabeth had dedicated the book to Catherine. To the most noble and virtuous Queen Catherine, Elizabeth, her humble daughter, wisheth perpetual felicity and everlasting joy. King Henry VIII died on the 28th of January 1547, he was 55. The new king, Elizabeth's little brother Edward, was at Hertford Castle. Edward's uncle, Edward Seymour, travelled to Enfield on the 30th of January, where they met Elizabeth. Brother and sister were informed of their father's passing. The two children, of nine and thirteen, wept inconsolably. Edward was proclaimed King Edward VI the next day. Their stepmother Catherine Parr, on the other hand, although sad, had other ideas about the king's passing. Catherine had been courting Thomas Seymour prior to marrying the king, and so she was now free to pursue that again if she so wished. Henry's funeral was on the 16th of February, and he was laid to rest with Edward's mother Jane Seymour at Windsor Castle in St George's Chapel. In the same month, Thomas Seymour, another of Edward VI's uncles, was looking for a marriage that would increase his power at court. He was rather jealous that his brother Edward Seymour had been made Lord Protector. He considered Catherine Parr, the king's widow and former beau, but she had relatively little power now. The king's oldest sister Mary was a Catholic, so no. And then there was the king's other sister, the Lady Elizabeth. She was 13, nearly childbearing age, and had inherited her mother's flirtatious charm and ability to captivate men. Thomas Seymour, Lord Sudley, decided to pursue Elizabeth, declaring his affection in flattering letters and begged her to know whether I am to be the most happy or the most miserable of men. Although she was 13, Elizabeth knew exactly what he was after, but Elizabeth was not able to choose her marriage partners. She would have to get the Privy Council's permission, and it was unlikely they would give it to her, 
in case her brother wanted to use her for a political alliance. Consequently, she turned down Seymour's proposal, saying, Neither my age nor my inclination allows me to think of marriage, and that she needed at least two years to get over the loss of her father before contemplating it. She went on, Permit me, my Lord Admiral, to tell you frankly that, though I decline the happiness of becoming your wife, I shall never cease to interest myself in all that can crown your merits with glory, and shall ever feel the greatest pleasure in being your servant and good friend. With that, Thomas went back to the drawing board. His options now consisted of the Catholic Lady Mary, or the Dowager Queen and former beau, Catherine Parr. Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour wed in secret in April, although they did do a terrible job at keeping it a secret. You guys should date. And then not tell me about it. I think she knows. Like the actual worst, people pretty much found out as soon as they got married. The Lady Mary found out about the wedding and was horrified as Catherine was supposed to be in mourning for her father, and she saw her as a disgrace. Mary was worried about Elizabeth putting herself morally at risk by keeping in contact with Catherine and wanting to protect her sister's innocence, she wrote to Elizabeth, warning her against contacting Catherine and begged her to think of her own reputation. But Elizabeth, despite rejecting the Lord Admiral, did have a crush on him. She just wasn't prepared to be used, and she was fond of her stepmother. She ignored Mary's warning and said that she shared Mary's grief for their father, and in seeing scarcely cold body of the king our father so shamefully dishonoured by the queen our stepmother. However, in her opinion, the best course to take was one of dissimulation and making the best of what we cannot remedy. In November 1547, Catherine published her second book, Lamentations of a Sinner. At this time, Elizabeth had been at her brother's court, but Edward was a staunch Protestant and he introduced a rigid ceremonial requirement that meant Elizabeth had to drop on one knee five times in front of her brother before seating herself far away from his side. Edward viewed Elizabeth as illegitimate, so that's why she wasn't able to sit with her brother. Catherine was probably aware of Elizabeth's situation and invited her to come live with her in 1548. Catherine discovered that she was pregnant in the march and while she was at daily prayers, her husband Thomas would go canoodling with their ward, Elizabeth. Catherine was too preoccupied being pregnant that she didn't notice or deliberately turned a blind eye to her husband openly engaging with Elizabeth in front of household staff. The trio stayed at Seymour Place in London in the spring. Thomas would go to Elizabeth's bedroom every morning wearing only his nightgown and slippers and burst in, regardless of whether or not she was in bed. Her lady-in-waiting, Mrs Catherine Ashley, was present and was immediately suspicious, thinking it an unseemly sight to see a man so little dressed in a maiden's chamber. Cat Ashley, sometimes Astley, was the only person in that household trying to protect Elizabeth. What really disturbed Mrs Ashley, according to her later deposition to the Privy Council, was that he only stayed if Elizabeth was in bed. If he found her up and dressed, he would just look in at the gallery door then leave. Despite Kat's best efforts, Thomas would continue his morning break-ins, and if Elizabeth was in bed, he would climb in and tickle her. On one occasion, he tried to kiss her, but Kat swooped in and sent him out. For the time being, Elizabeth seemed to be enjoying this attention. As we mentioned, she seemed to have a crush on him, and she didn't rebuff him. However, there are also accounts of Elizabeth rising early to try and avoid Thomas getting in her bed, as he would not act if she was already dressed. So at some point, Elizabeth potentially stopped enjoying the attention, or her love of it wasn't always consistent. And what did Catherine do? Nothing. 
She raised no protest when she heard that the Admiral would pull apart Elizabeth's bed curtains and make as though he would come at her, causing her to shrink back giggling into the bed to avoid being tickled. The Admiral said it was harmless and the Queen believed him. Catherine even accompanied her husband on some early morning visits to Elizabeth's room. While at Hamworth, the Seymour couple chased Elizabeth through the gardens. When Thomas caught her, they wrestled together. Thomas got some shears and cut Elizabeth's black gown into strips, while Catherine held her stepdaughter still, all the while laughing. Elizabeth's infatuation for the Admiral was pretty obvious, and not good at concealing it. Thomas was now fretting in case Catherine blamed him. So he told Catherine that he had seen Elizabeth with her arms round a man's neck. The Queen was shocked, and when she confronted the Lady Elizabeth, she cried and denied it, begging Catherine to speak with her ladies. Elizabeth was hardly alone, and the only man she came into contact with, apart from her servants and tutors, was Thomas. Catherine could see how distraught Elizabeth was, and knew she must be telling the truth. But why would Thomas lie to her? Unless he was protecting himself. Catherine now realised what her husband had been up to. One day in April, Catherine realised that both her husband and her stepdaughter were missing. She went in search of them, and she found them alone together, with Elizabeth in Thomas's arms. <laughs> as soon as they saw Catherine, they separated, but it was too late. Catherine had seen that both her husband and daughter had betrayed her. Elizabeth left the Seymours in May. Thomas made no attempt to see her go, but Catherine had. Her once warm and loving mother was cold. She merely said, God has given you great qualities. Cultivate them always and labour to improve them, for I believe you are destined by heaven to be Queen of England. Elizabeth kissed her and was gone, unable to bear Catherine's coldness. Elizabeth soon became ill, possibly grief-ridden, as she now saw that she had caused terrible hurt to the woman she called mother, and had potentially risked her reputation and her place in the succession. Thomas wrote to Elizabeth taking the blame, and swore to testify Elizabeth's innocence, if necessary. But she responded telling him, it was best if they didn't have any contact at all. And while Catherine was alive, he did just that. But this was in the June, like July time, and Catherine died in September, so it wasn't really that long. After Elizabeth's departure, Catherine made an effort to forget what had happened and rebuild her broken marriage. Eventually, relations between her and her husband did improve mainly by the shared pleasure of anticipating the birth of their child. Elizabeth wrote a letter to her stepmother, saying how truly I was replete with sorrow to depart from your highness. She signed the letter, Your Highness's Humble Daughter Elizabeth. It was undoubtedly a plea for forgiveness, and Catherine realised that Elizabeth had never intended her any real harm. She'd lost her head over a handsome man who should have known better. Catherine wrote a warm reply, assuring her stepdaughter of their friendship. Elizabeth responded to Catherine's letter on the 31st of July, saying her letter was most joyful to me. I'm personally glad that the two were able to reconcile their differences, because Catherine Parr would ultimately die on the 7th of September 1548 from childbirth complications. Elizabeth and Mary grieved for the loss of their stepmother, who had always been kind and protective of them. Catherine had always acted as the mediator in the family and her death would mark the beginning of a great divide between the sisters, who had once been close, but would now gradually grow ever more suspicious of each other and end as formidable rivals in the dangerous arena of politics and religion. Thomas had lost the small amount of power that he had after Catherine's death, and was still trying to get his comeuppance on his brother, Edward Seymour, Lord Protector, who had more influence with their nephew than what he did. Thomas Seymour snuck into the King's residence and planned to basically kidnap his nephew. Not a great plan. 
Unsurprisingly, Thomas Seymour was arrested in the January of 1549 for conspiring to kidnap the king, for shooting Edward VI's dog, and for his despicable behaviour with Elizabeth finally came to light. Edward was suspicious of his sister, so the 15-year-old Elizabeth was interrogated about her relationship with Seymour, and if there was any truth about the rumour of Elizabeth and Seymour getting married. Elizabeth stood her ground and insisted that she had not been involved with Seymour's plans, and that there had been no discussion of marriage. She did, however, admit to knowing of Seymour's ambition, but she claimed that she never encouraged it. Cat Ashley, Elizabeth's governess, testified the incidents that we discussed earlier, about how Seymour would climb into Elizabeth's bed and tickle her. Cat Ashley said although some affection was unwanted, Elizabeth would blush at the mention of his name. Elizabeth herself refused to say anything that could incriminate her. After all, plotting to marry a princess of England, even if she's an illegitimate one, without getting permission from the Lord Protector, was treason. Thomas Seymour was found guilty of treason and was beheaded on the 20th of March 1549. Seymour protested his innocence on the scaffold. When Elizabeth heard that he had been executed, she said, Today there died a man of much wit and very little judgment. Elizabeth's brother, King Edward VI, would die at the age of 15 on the 6th of July 1553. It was expected that her sister Mary would be queen, as Edward had no issue. But instead, her cousin Lady Jane was queen. I imagine Elizabeth was confused. Happy that a Protestant was on the throne again. But also angry, because if Mary had been glossed over, then so had Elizabeth's claim and potentially she was written out of the line of succession. Elizabeth was tactful, and she stayed quiet. Mary ousted Jane from the throne on the 19th of July, and was proclaimed queen. When Elizabeth heard, she rushed to London to swear loyalty to her sister. Knowing how much of a staunch Catholic she was, Elizabeth was preparing for a bumpy ride. Elizabeth had reached London on the 29th of July, just before Mary, and when Mary arrived on the 31st, Elizabeth rode out to the city gates to meet her sister. Mary had arrived with a full royal train, and relations between the two daughters of King Henry VIII had not always been friendly, but today it was all smiles, as the new queen raised her kneeling sister to her feet and embraced her. As the procession continued on its way towards London, the Lady Elizabeth felt like a princess, as she was in the place of honour immediately behind her sister, the Queen. Early in Mary's reign, she declared that Elizabeth was still illegitimate, and she went about reversing the Protestant reformations of her father and brother, bringing back a lot of the Catholic ways of worship. I believe that this actually would have had an effect on Elizabeth, because a lot of the Catholic ceremonies were glamorous, and full of royal pomp and extravagance. Although Elizabeth would reign as a Protestant ruler, she kept a lot of the ceremonial pomp that came with Catholic ceremonies. And the same can be said about royal ceremonies today. Because if there's one thing that we love about royalty, it's the glamour that they bring. The UK was pretty much saved from a recession thanks to Queen Elizabeth II. Because of the extravagance for her Platinum Jubilee in 2022, and again for her death and funeral in the same year, as it brought tourism and merchandising, and bank holidays so we could watch it. Right, let's get back to the OG Elizabeth. So, Mary started with her Catholic Reformation with the court. That meant everyone at court was supposed to go to Mass. Yes, Elizabeth, that includes you. Anne of Cleves and Elizabeth were the only two at court who stayed away from Mass and Mary grew ever colder towards her sister. Elizabeth knew that she had to please Mary to stay alive, but if she went to Mass, her Protestant lords and allies may turn against her. So, she blew hot and cold, sometimes begging Mary to send her teachers who would put her right on matters of religion, and sometimes bunking off so that the Protestants could see 
but she wasn't really serious. Mary knew that Elizabeth was just stringing her along. She didn't like her sister much now. She knew Elizabeth was more popular than she. But short of executing her, and she couldn't do that without a very good excuse, the only surefire way of scuppering Elizabeth was for Mary to have children. Mary had her coronation on the 1st of October 1553 at Westminster Abbey. Elizabeth once again took the place of honour, this time with Anne of Cleves. The two women shared an open chariot, which was richly arrayed with crimson velvet and a cloth of silver. They were also given new dresses that were made of a similar rich silver material, and in the procession to Westminster Abbey, they walked together directly behind the new queen. The first two months of 1554 saw the Wyatt Rebellion. This was in protest of Mary's plans to marry Philip, Prince of Spain. The rebels wanted to depose of Mary and replace her with Elizabeth. This support for Elizabeth proved to Mary just how dangerous her sister was, and she summoned her sister to the Palace of Whitehall. However, Elizabeth claimed that she was too ill to obey her sister's summons. Mary wondered if Elizabeth had taken a page out of her book when it came to feigning illnesses to get out of stuff, so she sent two doctors to check if Elizabeth was faking. When they arrived, she was ill. She was pale and she was weak. The doctors, however, did say that she was well enough to travel to London if she travelled by litter. So, she travelled by litter to Whitehall Palace. Elizabeth, though protesting her innocence in the Wyatt affair, was imprisoned in the Tower of London for two months. Elizabeth's cousin Jane was also implicated in the Wyatt business and was executed on the 12th of February 1554. On her arrest in 1554, Elizabeth wrote to Mary, imploring her to ignore evil persuasions that would persuade not one sister against the other. Elizabeth's imprisonment at the Tower was comfortable enough, though. Physically, she was allowed in the gardens and had four rooms in the old palace. But this was also where her mother had spent her last days before her execution. But it wasn't too bad because she did get to spend some quality time with Robert Dudley. If you know, then you know. Robert Dudley was Guildford's brother, the husband of Lady Jane Grey, and was probably there just for good measure. Although in separate parts of the tower, Robert and Elizabeth would have been allowed out for exercise together. As mentioned earlier, Elizabeth stayed at the same apartments where her mother had spent her last few days. Mary believed that Elizabeth was unloyal to her and Catholicism. Mary saw Elizabeth as illegitimate and she was interrogated several times, but she was strong in her denial of the involvement in the plot. Elizabeth's health wasn't good while in the tower, and she had difficulty sleeping, but she kept herself composed, just as she had during the Seymour scandal. Elizabeth was innocent of conspiracy, and Mary had her released due to lack of evidence. Within two months, Wyatt had been beheaded and the investigation stalled. No evidence could be found of Elizabeth's involvement, and she was released on the 19th of May the anniversary of her mother's death. But she would now be escorted to Woodstock, where she would be put under house arrest. I'm watching you, Wazowski. Always watching. Elizabeth spent the entire journey to Woodstock, fearing for her own assassination, as this would get her out of Mary's way, without Mary being held responsible for her sister's death. However, Mary was childless, and Elizabeth was her heir, so... Quite frankly, she was safe for now. Mary wed Philip of Spain on the 25th of July 1554 at Winchester Cathedral. Prior to the wedding, Philip was anxious to meet Elizabeth, as everyone had said she was more fun than Mary. He was probably thinking that he's marrying the wrong sister. Mary said no, but Philip kept insisting. See, Philip was also thinking about his own self-preservation. If Mary did manage to get pregnant, she might die in childbirth. Then Elizabeth would be queen. And Philip's father, the Emperor Charles V, was very anxious that she remain Spain's ally. Finally, Mary agreed and Elizabeth was brought to Hampton Court Palace. The two met on the 15th of April. 
Philip, to an extent, did actually help mend the sister's relationship, and she did ask him to assure Mary that she had no part in the Wyatt Rebellion, and because Mary was madly in love with her husband, she just took his word. Mary finally released Elizabeth from house arrest in August 1554. She was allowed to return to Hatfield, but she still did not trust her. Philip wanted to be sure that England was kept out of French hands, as the next heir after Elizabeth would be the Grey sisters, or Mary Queen of Scots, who was married to a French heir. Philip had to keep Elizabeth alive and cultivated. In 1556, Elizabeth was summoned to court. Philip and Mary were convinced that they could get Elizabeth to convert to Catholicism, if she had the right husband to manipulate her. They viewed her as very meek and easy to control, and Elizabeth would be a better heir than Mary Queen of Scots. Part two of Philip's cunning plan was for her to marry an ally of Spain, the Duke of Savoy. Elizabeth had been summoned to court and then ordered to marry the Duke. However, Elizabeth said, No, 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 And Mary threatened to lock her up in the tower again. It turned out to be only a threat. But Elizabeth was so scared that she wrote to the French ambassador, asking if she could come and live in France. He told her that if she wanted to inherit the English throne, she would have to stay where she was. By November 1558, Mary had had two, sometimes one depending on the sources, false pregnancies. Philip had run away to Flanders and Mary's health was declining. Despite her best efforts, her only heir was Elizabeth. And on the 6th of November 1558, Queen Mary I recognised the Lady Elizabeth as her heir. Mary would then die on the 17th of November 1558. It is said that when Mary I died, and the news was taken to Elizabeth, they say that she was reading in the garden. Elizabeth was happy when Mary died, and she said, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. Right, people who live in the UK, back me up in the comments section down below. She could not have been in the garden. I'm sorry, I do not buy that. Who sits in the garden in November in the UK? If you have ever lived in the UK during November, unless you are drinking, you do not sit in the garden because it is freezing and you are not telling me that she had a ski jacket. Okay, she might have had some furs, but I doubt that was keeping her warm enough in a garden in November. I don't buy it. When Mary died, she left Elizabeth a will she asked Elizabeth to become a Catholic, for the Spanish jewels to be returned to Philip, and Mary asked to be buried with her mother Catherine of Aragon, all of which Elizabeth didn't do. Elizabeth had a strong respect for the rights of kings and queens, even when they were enemies. Elizabeth didn't go to her sister's funeral, but she did make sure that Mary had a regal Catholic send-off. She didn't want to encourage disrespect for royalty. Elizabeth was clever. Her supporters were Protestants who hated flashy clothes, so during Mary's reign, Elizabeth wore black and white to please them. Mary was angry, as she wanted her sister to wear rich materials and jewels. Elizabeth did as her sister wished, but only once Mary was dead, and Elizabeth herself was queen. Elizabeth became queen at the age of 25, the same age that another Elizabeth became queen. Right, not being funny, but I'll be proper miffed if we ever have a Queen Elizabeth III and she doesn't become queen at 25. Completely broke the pattern. Elizabeth's sister Mary had been queen until her death on the 17th of November 1558. Mary had reluctantly put Elizabeth as her heir as she was unable to conceive a child with her absent husband. Mary was a Catholic and was adamant that her subjects should be too. Despite being told for the last 20 years or so that they were Protestants. As a result, England was a divided kingdom, thanks to Mary and the humiliating loss in Calais in January, which had knocked the confidence in England's military power and international reputation. 
When Queen Mary I died, their Catholic heir was Queen Mary I of Scotland, but she was married to a French prince, which is why the English Mary kept Elizabeth as her heir. Because apparently for Mary, being French was worse than being a Protestant? Mary, Queen of Scots' father-in-law, King Henry II of France, announced that Mary Stuart was the rightful Queen of England, not Elizabeth. However, this came at a bad time for the French, as a preacher called John Knox was leading a Protestant revolution in Scotland. Elizabeth didn't like John, but if it made things easier for her, then by all means. Knox and his sermons were turning Scottish nobles anti-French and anti-Catholic. In fact, the Scots wanted Elizabeth's help to fight the French. But Elizabeth had learnt two key lessons in her turbulent upbringing. Say nothing or lie. She said nothing. But secretly, she sent money to help the Scots. On Christmas Day, Elizabeth went to church and saw Bishop Carlyle raise the hoist of communion bread high for all to see. This was the Catholic way, so Elizabeth shouted, Lower that vessel at once! In spite, the bishop raised it higher, so Elizabeth stormed out in an outrage. Because of this, Elizabeth struggled to find a bishop to crown her at her coronation. In the end, Bishop Carlyle agreed to coronate her. Also, fun fact, Elizabeth had asked her favourite astrologer, Dr John Dee, to tell her the most favourable date for her coronation. He told her it was the 15th of January 1559. So, Elizabeth got coronated at Westminster Abbey on the 15th of January 1559. Her right to rule never really went unchallenged. Protestants couldn't cope with a female ruler, and Catholics viewed her as illegitimate. Elizabeth, like her sister, was very good at PR, and had the Tudor rose embroidered into her coronation gown to show that she is the embodiment of a true Tudor. The City of London was alive for her coronation. Elizabeth had always been popular, and pageants had been put on in London for her honour. The citizens of London and crowds formed at Westminster Abbey to watch her leave her litter and enter the Abbey. The Countess of Lennox, Lady Margaret Douglas, was nearly knocked over in the crush as she carried the Queen's train. The Archbishop held the crown high over Elizabeth's head and pronounced her Queen of England. For the first time ever, the coronation oath is read from an English Bible. A cheerful queen, in full regalia, carrying the sceptre and orb, chats to members of the congregation outside the abbey. Elizabeth's coronation was a huge success. She enjoyed being out and about among the people, and they adored her. The only trouble was... She caught a bad cold and had to stay in bed for a few days afterwards. <laughs> oh, it's funny because it's true. In February, Elizabeth passes the Act of Uformity, which is sometimes known as the Elizabethan Settlement. Through this, she was trying to offer religious compromise, re-establishing the monarch as the head of the Church of England, but retaining the Catholic rituals in hopes of clearing up the mess that her sister had made in her short reign. Those who refused to attend Church of England services were forced to pay a fine of a shilling a week for not attending church on Sundays or holy days. In 1559, Elizabeth turned down at least four proposals. Seeing as she was known as the Virgin Queen and never got married, I can imagine her response was like this. No, 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 no. The first proposal was from her brother-in-law, Philip. He wrote to her by letter and reminded Elizabeth of how supportive he had been while Mary was queen and how it was he that got her out of prison. He really just wanted to keep his hold in England and Elizabeth was not impressed. She turned him down. A few months later, Philip started new negotiations with a French princess. Elizabeth wrote to Philip that he couldn't have loved her that much if he couldn't wait four months for an answer. Philip then became engaged to the French princess. Despite this, Philip and Elizabeth would remain friendly. 
That is until she starts to poke the bear. The second was Prince Eric of Sweden, who she rejected in the May. Eric was the eldest son of the King of Sweden and was a Protestant. He sent his handsome brother, Duke John of Finland, to woo her. Can we just take a minute to appreciate John's moustache? I mean, my God, look at that thing. It's just so majestic. They got on so well that people thought John and Elizabeth would wed. She turned Eric down, but that wasn't enough for him to get the message. Two months later, he was writing to her that he would go through wind and storm to be with her. A year later, he did just that, and his fleet was blown apart. He had to turn back. Still, he wouldn't give up. In the end, Elizabeth said no to him four times. Then there was the King of Denmark, and uh, his envoy had a, a pretty good idea. Don't worry, Mr B. I have a cunning plan to solve the problem. He pranced around the court wearing a velvet doublé with a pierced heart on it. It didn't do him or his master any favours with Elizabeth. Not a great plan. And finally, Archduke Charles of Austria. Charles was the main contender, even if there was a bit of confusion. Charles was a relative of Philip II of Spain, Elizabeth's ex-brother-in-law, who was also trying for her hand. So the ambassador has to be wingman for both. In the end, the imperial ambassador pushed forward Charles. Elizabeth kept the Archduke Charles on a string for ages. One night, when the imperial ambassador was about to give up hope, he met the queen in her barge on the river. The two barges drew alongside. Elizabeth invited him aboard. She played the lute to him and let him think that Charles was in with a chance. He wasn't really. In the summer of 1560, Elizabeth I had a problem. The Protestant lords that supported John Knox, the guy that Elizabeth was secretly funding, well, he was losing popularity and there was the constant threat that France would aid the Scottish Catholics. To make matters worse, Mary, Queen of Scots, was calling herself the Queen of England. The cheek, the nerve, the gall, the audacity and the gumption. Mary was also using England's crest on her coat of arms. Elizabeth sent William Cecil to Scotland to ease tensions and to get the Scottish to sign the Treaty of Edinburgh, which stated that Mary, Queen of Scots, and her husband, the King of France, recognise Elizabeth as the rightful Queen of England and that Queen Mary will stop using the English crest in her coats of arms. The treaty was signed by proxy in Scotland but the monarchs in France refused to ratify the treaty. This would only be the beginning of the clash between queens. On the 8th of September, Amy Dudley, the wife of Sir Robert, died after falling down some stairs. Now, Amy's death is really mysterious and it's actually worthy of an episode all on its own, as it really does have the makings of a true murder mystery. So for now, I'm just going to summarise what happens and we can dig into the meat of these bones later. The TLDR, Elizabeth and Robert's affections for each other have always been obvious and some thought the Queen might have been involved. As a result, Robert was now out of favour until it was ruled that Amy's death was accidental. But what it did mean was that any chance that the two had of getting together was now out of the question, thanks to the dark cloud created by Amy's mysterious death. Elizabeth would never go on to have children, and Mary, Queen of Scots, was indeed an heir to the English throne, but she wasn't the only one. The surviving Grey sisters, Catherine and Mary, had been at court under the monarch's watchful eye since their sister Jane usurped the throne for 13 days in 1553. Check out my other video on their sister Jane for more info. As Tudor princesses, it was illegal for them to marry without the consent of the monarch, in case they, the monarch, wanted to arrange political matches which I'm sure Elizabeth had planned for the sisters. See, the thing is, Lady Catherine Grey had asked Elizabeth's predecessor Mary for permission to marry, well, Mary was queen, 
and she had consented, but Mary never got round to signing the paperwork before she died. Lady Catherine Grey married Edward Seymour, Lord Hartford, nicknamed Ned, and I'm going to refer to him as Ned to avoid confusion. So they got married in secret in December 1560. Their sole eyewitness died in March 1561, which meant that Catherine was in real trouble when she became pregnant in the same year. Catherine, now Lady Hartford, concealed the marriage from everyone for months, even after she became pregnant. She knew that due to Mary's death, she had committed treason, and now in her eighth month of pregnancy in July 1561, she was desperately running out of time. Desperate, Catherine confided in Bess of Hardwick, hoping she might help her with her case with the Queen. Bess refused to listen to Catherine and berated her for implicating herself. Catherine then went to Robert Dudley, who was kind of family if you squint and tilt your head, because his brother Guildford was married to Catherine's sister Jane. Visiting Robert's bedroom in the middle of the night, she explained her dilemma. As Dudley's room adjoined the Queen's chambers, he was afraid that they might be overheard, or that he might be caught with a visibly pregnant woman at his bedside, and he tried to get rid of Catherine as soon as he could. The next day, he told Elizabeth everything he knew regarding Catherine and her pregnancy. Catherine was then forced to reveal to her cousin, Queen Elizabeth, that she had secretly married Ned Seymour, Earl of Hertford, and that she was carrying his child. Ned had been sent abroad on a diplomatic mission by Elizabeth, and the heavily pregnant Catherine was left with no options. She was alone, and she must have been terrified. But she could no longer keep her marriage hidden. Catherine was sent to the Tower of London on the 5th of September, along with Ned, where Catherine then gave birth to their son, who they also called Edward, on the 21st of September. The baby was christened in the tower on the 25th, and Elizabeth declared the marriage and the baby illegitimate, as they had no proof that they were even married, and therefore the baby was born out of wedlock as far as Elizabeth was concerned. The baby Edward was problematic, as from a certain point of view, it could be seen as an attempt for the throne. After all, Catherine had a claim, and she had now continued the line with a male heir. Declaring the child as illegitimate was the most practical thing Elizabeth could have done for her own safety. And as Elizabeth dealt with one treacherous heir, another one returns to Scotland. Mary's husband died, and she is sent back to Scotland. Within days of arrival, Mary sent a representative to England to ask Elizabeth to acknowledge her as heir to the English throne. The cheek, the nerve, the gall, the audacity and the gumption. Elizabeth refused to acknowledge Mary as her rightful heir. She simply refused to name her as such for fears of plots and conspiracies. And can I just say that I think Elizabeth was right when we find out the amount of plots and conspiracies that went on. In the autumn of 1562, the 29-year-old Elizabeth contracted smallpox. It was fatal, and at one point, it would look like that she would not recover. And, without an heir, another panic for the succession occurred. Many people, including the Queen's adviser, Cecil, favoured the claim of Catherine Grey. Elizabeth recovered, although she would be scarred, but she realised the danger that Catherine posed to her throne which wasn't helped when she fell pregnant for the second time in 1563. Elizabeth was always suspicious of such talk, remembering her days under Mary's rule, and once said, So long as I live, I shall be Queen of England. When I am dead, they shall succeed that have most right. Elizabeth passed her smallpox on to her lady-in-waiting, Lady Sidney, the sister of Robert Dudley. Thankfully, she survived. Some of Elizabeth's ladies weren't so lucky. When Elizabeth thought she was going to die from smallpox, she asked the Privy Council to make Robert Dudley protector of the realm and to give him a suitable title. But that never happened as the Queen thankfully recovered 
so Dudley was made a Privy Council member instead. Despite being kept in separate cells, in February 1563, Catherine Grey gave birth to Ned Seymour's second child, Thomas Seymour, in the Tower of London. Right, seriously, Seymours, come on, there are other names in the world than Edward and Thomas, okay? It just makes history so confusing when everybody is either named Edward Seymour, Thomas Seymour or Jane Seymour. Honestly, go have a look. Sorry, rant over, it just stresses me out because it makes it difficult to figure out who's who. The lieutenant of the tower, Edward Warner, was a kind man and had allowed the couple to spend time together. He left certain doors unlocked and paid no attention to who passed through. Ned had to pay a fine for getting his wife pregnant. One must sympathise with Elizabeth though. Not only had Catherine and Ned disdained and insulted the Crown by their earlier offences, that was awful enough. But now they'd done it again? No remorse, no realisation of the enormity of their crime. Just the same stupid, disrespectful behaviour. Elizabeth's patience, which she never did have lots of, was at an end. Elizabeth was very intelligent and conscious of her own position. She assumed Catherine must, at the very least, understand her position as well. Had she not learnt from her sister Jane's mistakes? She could not be so foolish and thoughtless as everyone argued in her defence. Everyone knew that actions have consequences. And so must Catherine Grey. Right, let's hop back to Elizabeth's other heir, Mary, Queen of Scots. She was looking for a husband again. This was not good. Elizabeth needed to try and sway her cousin to a match that wouldn't be a disadvantage for England. Originally, talks were opened with a match for Don Carlos, the son of Philip II of Spain. What?! But Elizabeth made it clear that she would view this as a hostile act. Elizabeth tried to neutralise the threat by suggesting the Duke of Norfolk, the Earl of Arundel and even her favourite Sir Robert Dudley. But Mary had eyes for Henry Stuart, the Lord Darnley, who was also a grandchild of Mary Tudor. So, like Mary, he had a strong claim to the English throne. Her suggestion of Robert shows how desperate Elizabeth was, because he was hers. In Elizabeth's head, Mary would give up living in Scotland and come live in England, in Elizabeth's court, so she could still be with Robert. But let's get real, that would never have happened. Mary at first inquired if Elizabeth was serious, wanting above all to know her chances of inheriting the English crown. Elizabeth repeatedly declared that she was prepared to acknowledge Mary as her heir only on the condition that she married Robert Dudley. Mary's Protestant advisers warmed to the prospect of her marriage to Dudley and in September 1564, Dudley was created Earl of Leicester, a move designed to make him more acceptable to Mary. And how did Robert feel about this? He was horrified at the idea of being sent to Scotland. He looked thoroughly gloomy when the Queen knighted him in the September of 1564 and she shocked everyone by tickling his neck in the middle of the solemn ceremony. He needn't have worried though. Mary didn't want a man with rumours of murder hanging over him and she wanted to marry Lord Darnley. Fortunately for Dudley, the marriage arrangement was called off in January 1565 Neither Robert or Mary was enthusiastic about the match, and despite Elizabeth agreeing to name Mary Queen of Scots as her heir, she couldn't actually bring herself to do it. Mary married her second husband, Henry Stuart Lord Darnley, on the 29th of July 1565, and she gave birth to their first child, James, at Edinburgh Castle on the 19th of June 1566. However, Darnley was not the nicest human being and he conveniently died in a house explosion, you know, after his wife Mary had witnessed him murder her friend Rizzio. Three months after his death, Mary Queen of Scots married again on the 15th of May 1567 to James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell. 
The marriage was unpopular, especially with Elizabeth. The marriage divided the country into two camps. When Elizabeth found out that Mary was planning on marrying James Hepburn, Elizabeth sent Mary a series of letters begging her not to do so. And I've got a snippet here from her letter. I exhort you, I counsel you and I beseech you to take this thing so much to heart that you will not fear to touch even him who you have nearest to you if the thing touches him. Praying the Creator to give you the grace to recognise this traitor and protect yourself from him as from the ministers of Satan. I wish as much good to you as my heart is able to imagine, or as you were able a short while ago to wish. Heartfelt recommendations to you, very dear sister. Elizabeth knew what a terrible effect marrying Bothwell would have on Mary's reputation. Here is another extract from the letter she wrote to her. No good friend you have in the world can like thereof, and if we should otherwise write or say, we should abuse you. For how can a worse choice be made for your honour than in such haste to marry a subject who, besides other notorious lacks, public fame, has charged with the murder of your husband? Elizabeth was right, and in the civil war that would follow, Mary was defeated, and instead of going to France, where she had friends and family, Mary decided to go to England, where she knew no one. Not a great plan. In what I can only describe as an incredibly stupid decision, the last thing Elizabeth needed was a Catholic cousin with a claim to the English throne, gate-crashing her country. Things went south in Scotland, and Mary was forced to abdicate in favour of her son, James, who became King James VI of Scotland. Elizabeth was outraged. She sided with Mary. She believed that what the laws had done was abhorrent. They had imprisoned and deposed an anointed queen, a crime against God that was even greater than Darnley's assassination months earlier. In Elizabeth's mind, nothing justified the action against Mary. Elizabeth's other heir, Catherine Grey, wasn't having a great time either, as she had fallen into a deep depression as she was being kept away from Ned and she had refused to eat. And eventually, Catherine Grey died on the 26th of January, 1568. Some people believe that she died of a broken heart. Mary arrived in England on the 16th of May, 1568, by fishing boat. When Mary arrived, Elizabeth was torn. On one hand, she supported Mary's right as monarch to the Scottish throne and found it hard to support those that would like to keep Mary off the throne. But she was also aware that the Earl of Moray, who was currently regent in Scotland, was supportive of English Protestant interests and Mary's restoration would destroy all of that. Rather surprisingly, Elizabeth was all for helping Mary at first. Maybe it was to get rid of her, maybe not. One of Elizabeth's core beliefs was that kings and queens were sent by God to rule their subjects and that subjects had no right to kick them out. Elizabeth's counsellors didn't agree. They thought Mary was guilty of murdering her second husband and that Elizabeth should hand her cousin over to Mary's half-brother, Lord James Murray, who was ruling Scotland with a Protestant coalition. An inquiry was held, but it ultimately proved nothing. So Mary was shut up in Tapbury Castle as a prisoner of the Queen. Elizabeth had spent the majority of her reign avoiding marriage proposals and putting out the flames of family members declaring their right as heir. One of her cousins, Catherine Grey, would die before she had the chance, and her other cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, was becoming more problematic forever demanding to be named heir. Mary had escaped to England instead of France, and she was now a beacon of hope for the Catholics that lived in England. As a result, Elizabeth faced several plots and rebellions in her reign, and the first one we're going to look at is the Northern Earls Rebellion in early 1569. So when looking at these plots, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it down into two sections, the plot and then Elizabeth's actions, 
and then I'm just going to talk a little bit more about it in general afterwards. Okay, so the plot. The Catholic Earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland hatched a plan to get Mary Queen of Scots out of imprisonment and onto the throne. They gathered an army of 6,000 soldiers in their attempt to return England to Catholicism. Elizabeth's actions. Elizabeth got wind of the plan and sent a huge army to crush the rebellion. Elizabeth put 800 rebels to death and the two earls fled to Scotland. When the rebellion failed, the Pope got all excited about the prospect of potentially having a Catholic Queen again and excommunicated Elizabeth in 1570 to encourage more Catholics to rebel. The Papal Bull in 1570 specifically released Elizabeth's subjects from their allegiance to her, basically saying that she is not your queen and you can rebel. Also in his bull of excommunication, Pope Pius V declared that Elizabeth should be deprived of her pretended title to the kingdom. This meant that any foreign prince was entitled to invade and take her throne, and he also freed all of Elizabeth's subjects from their oath of allegiance. He went as far to say that to support Elizabeth would lead to eternal damnation. The Pope also started encouraging Spain to invade England and replace Elizabeth with Mary Stuart, her Catholic cousin. Parliament and the Privy Council were outraged. They urged Elizabeth to clamp down on Catholics. It was the beginning of the end of Elizabeth's even-handed religious policy. From then on, Elizabeth was hard on Catholics although nothing like as hard as her sister Mary had been on Protestants. The next year saw the Ridolfi plot. So the plot was, the Duke of Norfolk, Elizabeth's cousin, had fallen in love with Mary. He had fallen in love with her when he was chairing the inquiry. Elizabeth put him in the tower because he was getting ideas about marrying Mary, and when she let him out, he was plotting with an Italian banker called Rodolfo and the Spanish Duke of Alva within weeks. Roberto Ridolfi planned to assassinate Elizabeth and make Mary Queen. He had support of King Philip II of Spain, Elizabeth's cousin, the Duke of Norfolk, and obviously Mary, Queen of Scots. Norfolk felt unappreciated by the English Queen, and talks had fluttered about him marrying Mary ever since she arrived in England. So the plan was for him and Mary to marry once she was free, to strengthen her claim over the English throne, regain the Scottish throne, and then elevate Norfolk's power. Mary denounced her ties with the French and openly embraced that of Catholic Spain. Elizabeth's actions? Well, the plot was uncovered by Elizabeth's chief advisor, William Cecil. Ridolfi was expelled from the country and Norfolk was executed as a result. After the Ridolfi plot, Elizabeth had to acknowledge Mary as a threat and placed her in stricter custody. At first, Elizabeth refused to sign the death warrant for the Duke of Norfolk, as she hated executing people, especially those that she knew well. However, her guilt wouldn't hold out for long, as the Duke of Norfolk was beheaded on the 2nd of June, 1572. She has got a bit of a habit of accidentally executing family members. Wonder where she got that from. Feeling like she needed an ally against Spain, and the threat of Mary, Elizabeth entered marriage talks in late December with the then Duke of Anjou, who later became King Henry III of France. Nothing came of this marriage and Henry would go on to marry Louise of Lorraine. Despite inheriting her grandfather's frugality and spending far less money than her father, England was broke. Even cutting her allowance at court wasn't helping as Elizabeth was still spending more money than she was bringing in. She wasn't in favour of raising taxes, as that would upset her subjects, and the only time Parliament would justify raising tax was in the case of war, and Elizabeth wasn't a fan of war. Enter pirateer Francis Drake. Hello there. Unlike Jack Sparrow, well, there should be a captain in there somewhere. Francis Drake was a pretty good pirate, good enough to gain a knighthood from the Queen and to enrage the Spanish king he was robbing from. Elizabeth got on well with these sea captains. There are others, but the most famous was Sir Francis Drake, and they were mainly Protestant. The sea captains were loyal to her, and they were always up for an adventure. Drake made the Queen rich, and captured a huge haul of gold and jewels which the Spanish had discovered in the New World, but he brought it back to England. Elizabeth invited him to meet her 
as she wanted to know all about his travels. Also that year, the Protestants in the Netherlands had begun a revolt against the Spanish rule. This became known as the Dutch Revolt. Elizabeth secretly supported the Dutch rebels because she knew the Dutch Revolt would keep the Spanish too busy to threaten England. The Netherlands were ruled by Spain, but the English saw the Netherlands as a vital place for trade. By 1572, Protestant ideas had spread in the Netherlands and Protestant Dutch rebels began a campaign for independence from the Catholic Spain, leading to the Dutch Revolt. King Philip of Spain sent an army to defeat the rebels. Following the death of the Dutch rebel leader, William of Orange, not the same William of Orange that became King of England, I think it's like his grandfather or something, Elizabeth was approached to become Queen of the Dutch. She declined but sent an army to fight with the Dutch against Spain. Throughout the 1590s, the Dutch won several victories against the Spanish and by 1609, after Elizabeth's death, the Dutch Protestants had won control of Holland. In 1574, Elizabeth sent more family members to the Tower. Margaret Douglas requested to take her surviving son up north to visit Scotland. On their journey north, mother and son stayed with Bess of Hardwick, and it was here where Charles, Margaret Douglas's son, would meet and fall in love with his future wife, Elizabeth Cavendish, who produced Arbella Stewart another family member with a claim to her throne. The marriage and child were arranged secretly by both Margaret Douglas and Bess of Hardwick. Having none of this, Elizabeth demanded that both women come to London. Upon their arrival, Elizabeth sent both Margaret Douglas and Bess of Hardwick to the Tower. This time in the Tower, Margaret frequently wrote to Mary Queen of Scots and sent her a gift of lace made from her own white hairs. Gross. The year after Elizabeth's favourite, Robert Dudley, threw a 19-day pageant at Kenilworth Castle to persuade Elizabeth to marry him. She couldn't realistically say yes, no matter what her heart might have felt, and at which point Dudley moved on, and he would marry Elizabeth's relative, Latisse Knowles, on the 21st of September, 1578, much to her annoyance. Elizabeth's favourite pirate begins his voyage around the world in 1577, and he wouldn't return until 1580. Elizabeth went into business with Drake and invested lots of money in his latest expedition to the New World. Walsingham, Robert Dudley and Sir Christopher Hatton were also investors, and Drake set off around the world. Elizabeth also opened up trade between England and the Barbary states, which was namely Morocco as well as the Ottoman Empire, in 1578 as another move to spite the Spanish. By the November of 1578, King Philip of Spain was getting rather annoyed at Elizabeth and her sea captains, so she realised it might be a good idea to get herself an ally, maybe a French prince? Elizabeth had initially begun talks with the Duke of Anjou back in 1571. However, he was now married and the King of France, so she looked to his younger brother, Francis, the Duke of Anjou, and Alencion. He was available, and in 1578, he sent over his smooth-talking courtier to suck up to Elizabeth, Jean de Simier. Jean de Simier was a dodgy character. He had just murdered his brother, but he was a real charmer, and he soon had the whole court talking about how close he was with Elizabeth. Not everyone was against Simier, despite the murder, William Cecil, Elizabeth's chief counsellor, who was now Lord Burley, was very keen on a French marriage and an heir who would see off Mary, Queen of Scots. Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, on the other hand, was very gloomy at the thought of the Queen marrying. The Duke of Anjou was in fact the only one of Elizabeth's foreign suitors to court her in person. He was 24 and Elizabeth was 46. Despite the age gap, the two soon became very close. Elizabeth dubbed him her frog. While a few believe this nickname arose from a frog-shaped earring he'd given her, let's be honest, frog has been an unflattering slang nickname for the French for centuries. Many were horrified at this relationship because he was a Catholic. The summer of 1579, we think, is when Elizabeth found out about Robert Dudley marrying Latisse Knowles. Elizabeth was dealt the crushing blow of Dudley's betrayal. She herself was actually engaged in negotiations for a potential marriage with the Duke of Anjou, 
but that did not make the news any easier to swallow. So incandescent with rage was she that her initial reaction was to send Dudley to the tower. A punishment he was thankfully spared, thanks to the intercession of the Earl of Sussex. Nevertheless, he retired from court in disgrace, leaving his new wife, Latisse, to bear the brunt of the Queen's fury. Elizabeth was furious, and her counsellors pointed out that it wasn't actually against the law for an unmarried man to marry. Lester was saved from the tower, although he was told to stay at home for a bit, and when Latisse Dudley showed up at court in her best gear, Elizabeth boxed her ears and said, As but one sun lights the east, I will have but one queen in England. She never had a good word to say for Latisse, and called her the she-wolf. Over the course of the next decades, the queen would react poorly towards any hint of the couple's closeness, and it does seem that despite the pressure of royal displeasure, the couple were happily married. Spurred on by her heartbreak, Elizabeth made a big play for Francis. The first step was to see him in person. Usually, princes and dukes refused point-blank to come to England to be looked at like prize ponies, but Anjou wasn't phased. Anjou was called back to France at the end of August when a friend of his was killed in a duel. By the time he reached home, he had sent Elizabeth seven letters. In one, he wrote... If your majesty will consent to marry me, you will restore a languishing life which has existed only for the service of the most perfect goddess of the heavens. Elizabeth liked her men to talk to her like this. She was quite taken with Anjou and she wrote a poem about how she felt. In October 1579, marriage negotiations were now underway. However, Elizabeth's counsellors put their feet down about some of the terms proposed by the French. They weren't prepared to crown the Duke of Anjou King of England immediately. He'd have to wait until after the coronation, and they were not prepared to give him an income of £60,000 a year. Parliament also hated the idea of their Queen marrying a Frenchman. The idea of a marriage to a Catholic Frenchman was even worse, and it was very unpopular with many of Elizabeth's Protestant subjects and in the November of 1579, it really did look as if Elizabeth might actually marry. I feel like Elizabeth must have looked back at when Mary married Philip. That marriage was extremely unpopular, and the Wyatt Rebellion happened as a result. Could she be facing the same thing if she also went through with this unpopular match? So instead of pushing ahead, she asked her counsellors what she should do next. When they came down against the marriage, she burst into tears. The next day, they came back, very contrite, and said that they would do anything if it would make her happy. Elizabeth and the Duke of Anjou saw each other on and off over the next few years. Anjou was fighting on the Protestant side in the Netherlands, and he wanted Elizabeth to back him. On one occasion, they appeared together on a balcony, and Elizabeth announced that she was really going to marry him. She kissed Anjou on the lips took a ring from her finger and gave it to him. Technically, it was official that they were engaged, but then the very next day she called him to her privy chamber and said that she could not marry him. Rather than cause unrest, the Queen's virginity became an unlikely source of unity, a defiant symbol of her virtue and sacrifice. Portraits of Elizabeth became loaded with symbolism borrowed from the Virgin Mary or from the chaste classical goddess Diana. And... Like a goddess, Elizabeth's appearance in art remained ever youthful. Loyal supporters wore her image as a badge, courtiers gushed their admiration in poetry, and the wider country celebrated in festivals and pageants. Elizabeth was married to England. In 1580, Francis Drake returned home from his world voyage. Look what I got. I got a jar of dirt. Being a much better pirate than Jack Sparrow, Drake returned with £800,000 worth of stolen treasure, not to mention some sample potatoes and a tobacco plant and tales of strange creatures called llamas. Drake gave Elizabeth a crown that had five emeralds in it, which she wore the following New Year's Day. He was knighted the next year as a result for all of his presents to the Queen. Elizabeth couldn't afford war with Philip, but she was determined to weaken his power by providing support in the Netherlands and get her pirates to rob his. Despite having changed her mind about her frog, the Duke of Anjou was still in England, 
and by December 1581, she wanted to get rid of him so badly that she paid him £10,000 just to get rid of him. I'm going to show you a picture now from the National Archives website showing you just how much that would roughly be in today's money. Robert Dudley was charged with escorting the Duke of Anjou to Holland. Elizabeth was nearly 50 by the time it was finally over with Anjou. There was now no question of her ever producing a baby. The person with the best claim to succeed her was Mary Queen of Scots, who was still stuck in prison. Mary's arrival in England had destabilised Elizabeth's control over her country. If you remember, Pope Pius V had excommunicated Elizabeth just after Mary arrived in England back in 1570. And this meant there were always some Englishmen who felt it was their duty to get rid of Elizabeth from the throne of England. But now the Pope went even further. He said, There is no doubt that whoever sends that guilty woman out of the world with the pious intention of doing God's service not only does not sin, but gains merit. It was an open invitation to English Catholics to kill the Queen and put Mary on the throne. November 1583 saw the Throckmorton plot. The plot? A young Catholic man, Francis Throckmorton, organised a plan for a French army to invade England and replace Elizabeth with Mary, which was paid for by King Philip II of Spain and the Pope. Elizabeth's actions? Throckmorton was executed and Mary was moved to Tutbury Castle in Staffordshire, where she was held in isolation and was allowed no visitors. The unravelling of the Throckmorton plot also to replace Elizabeth with Mary led to the creation of the Bond of Association and the Act of Security of the Queen's person in 1584. Mary, though not specifically named, was now responsible for future plots instigated in her name. Sir Francis Throckmorton was tortured on the rack, a form of torture that left victims crippled for life. Throckmorton gave nothing away the first time round, but the thought of a second session on the rack was too much for him and he told Walsingham everything he wanted to know. This is how Elizabeth learned that Philip II of Spain was planning the Enterprise of England, a Catholic crusade to conquer England and put Mary Queen of Scots on the throne. Throckmorton was hanged at Tyburn and the Spanish ambassador kicked out but Elizabeth's Parliament and Council were seriously worried by the Throckmorton plot. They thought that Mary Queen of Scots should have been among those executed, but Elizabeth wouldn't hear of it. Perhaps she remembered how she herself had been the centre of every plot going when her sister was Queen, whether she liked it or not. Maybe she simply didn't want to create a Catholic martyr. Whatever the reason, even though she was often angry at Mary, she said there was no real proof against her. This wasn't good enough, though, for Francis Walsingham, who was determined to catch Mary. Don't worry, Mr B. I have a cunning plan to solve the problem. Francis Walsingham set out to entrap Mary. Pretty soon, he had proof that Mary was in league with all sorts of people, which included the banished Spanish ambassador and the French ambassador. They were in league with various English Catholics, including an eager young man called Sir Anthony Babington. Babington was so confident that his plot to murder Elizabeth and put Mary on the throne would succeed that he had his portrait painted with his fellow conspirators. Not a great plan. The last plot against Elizabeth that we're going to look at today is the Babington plot which took place in July 1586. The plot? Sir Anthony Babington planned to rescue Mary from jail and murder Elizabeth. Secret letters between the plotters and Mary were discovered, which gave the evidence needed to prove Mary's guilt. Elizabeth's actions? This finally led to the execution of Mary, Babington and six other plotters. As a likely successor to Elizabeth, Mary spent 19 years as Elizabeth's prisoner, because Mary was the focus for rebellion and possible assassination plots, such as the Babington plot. Mary was also a temptation for potential invaders, such as Philip II of Spain. In a letter to Mary in 1586, Elizabeth wrote, You had planned to take my life and ruin my kingdom 
I never proceeded so harshly against you. Walsingham uncovered this plot by Anthony Babington. Mary's correspondence was under surveillance. Mary had addressed the letter to Babington, apparently endorsing the plot. Sir Francis Walsingham sent spies to Mary's prison, pretending to be her servants. When Mary sent a letter to Anthony Babington, the servants took it to Walsingham first. Mary tried writing in code, but she sent Babington the code, which meant that Walsingham had a copy. This would be the final plot to put Mary on the throne and would ultimately be her downfall. Thanks to the incredible spy work of Walsingham, Mary was moved to Fotheringhay Castle in North Hampshire in October 1586, where she was tried for treason. Elizabeth was banking on Mary pleading guilty and begging for forgiveness, which would allow Elizabeth to pardon her cousin and in turn save her life. But Mary refused the right of commissioners to try her. She argued against the legality of the trial and maintains that, as a foreign anointed queen, she had never been an English subject and thus could not be convicted of treason. Don't you just love loopholes? Shame it didn't work, though. Mary was found guilty having compassed and imagined the hurt, death and destruction of the royal person. Despite unrelenting pressure from Parliament and her councillors to carry out Mary's sentence, Elizabeth hesitated to order the execution. In her eyes, Mary remained a legitimate sovereign and she was concerned that killing her would set a dangerous precedent. Although I would argue that she wasn't as she was forced to abdicate. Mary was put on trial and it was clear that she had been plotting against Elizabeth. The only card she had to play was that no court in England had the right to try the Queen of another country. In English law, every man had the right to be tried by his equals. This meant that if you were an Earl or a Duke on trial, you had the right to a jury of Earls and Dukes. They were your peers and this is where the word peer, meaning lord, comes from. This tradition also meant that a monarch could never be tried because, one, he didn't owe any loyalty to anyone else, so he couldn't commit treason, and two, he had no peers who could judge him. Although, unfortunately, King Charles I wasn't so lucky on that first one. Despite the law, Mary was tried by a court full of English peers and counsellors. She was found guilty and sentenced to death. The councillors were determined to have Mary's head. They were done with Elizabeth making excuses. Sir John Davison slipped the warrant in among a lot of other papers she had to sign, so she could pretend that she didn't notice what she was signing. The death warrant was handed to William Cecil as soon as she signed it, so she couldn't change her mind. The death warrant had been signed on the 1st of February 1587, and Mary was beheaded a week later, on the 8th. Elizabeth changed her mind after signing the death warrant, but her counsellors had carried out the sentence without her knowing, although I find that extremely hard to believe. Like, yeah, all right, Elizabeth, who are you kidding? Mary was executed, her head severed in three blows. When Mary was executed, her head was supposed to be lifted high in the air by the executioner to prove that she was dead, but Mary was wearing a wig. When he grabbed it, the head slipped out and bounced on the floor. Mary was dressed in black. When the time came, she removed her black dress to reveal a red petticoat. She slipped on red sleeves. She wore red so the blood wouldn't show and she wore a turban round her head to keep her hair out of the way of the axe. But then I feel like that contradicts the wig story, so again, I don't know how much of this is actually fiction and how much is fact. I mean, I know the fact that her head was chopped off, that was definitely fact. And her eyes were bound with a white cloth trimmed with gold. The axeman's assistant held her body still while the axe fell. It missed her neck and cut into the back of her head. The second chop was a much better shot but it still needed a bit of sawing with the axe to finish it off. Mary's pet dog, a Skye Terrier, had slipped into the hall under the cover of her skirts and was still hiding there when the head was off. It finally came out whimpering. It is said that the dog refused to eat and pined away and died. To be honest, the bit with the dog, well, actually, to be honest, the whole thing kind of sounds like a romanticisation of her beheading bit like with Jane Grey fumbling for the block. Let me know what you think in the comments section down below. Mary's heart was removed and put in a glass jar. The English didn't want any of that Robert the Bruce nonsense with loyal Scots 
following a heart into a battle. The heart was buried in the castle grounds. Mary had asked to be buried in France. It was actually buried in Peterborough. I mean, I've heard that Peterborough looks just like France in the summer, right? In 1612, her son, King James I of England, had her coffin moved to Westminster Abbey. Her heart still lays buried in the grounds of Fotheringhay Castle, where she was executed. Elizabeth was furious when she found out that the execution had already happened. The council pleaded with Elizabeth, claiming they wanted to spare her the pain of having to order Mary's death. Elizabeth claimed her advisers had betrayed her wishes. Elizabeth might have been genuinely distraught by the execution, but it was already too late. The minute that she'd signed the death warrant, quite frankly, Elizabeth did apologise to Mary's son, James. I'm sorry. In her letter to James, she wrote, My dearest brother, I want you to know the huge grief I feel for something which I did not want to happen and that I am innocent in the matter. James accepted the apology, but the Spanish, not so much. In all honesty, I think James mourned less than what Elizabeth did, but that's for another time. After ordering the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, her adoption of mourning clothes and pretense that the decision hadn't been hers was an act of self-pitying hypocrisy worthy of her father. Mary had been involved with the Babington plot, which planned to kill Elizabeth and replace her with the former Scottish Queen. As a result, Elizabeth accidentally signed her cousin's death warrant and the Scottish Queen was executed at Fotheringhay Castle. Elizabeth wrote to Mary's son, King James VI for Scotland, and told him, I'm sorry. He was fine. But the Spanish, not so much. And we're going to be looking at some of the consequences of Elizabeth beheading Mary, Queen of Scots. As it turned out, the consequences weren't as serious as Elizabeth had feared. The English Catholics pled loyalty to Elizabeth. Scotland, as briefly mentioned earlier, didn't really care, as now King James VI was now Elizabeth's potential heir. France still wanted an alliance with England, as they were scared of the mighty Spain, and Spain was already warring with England over the pirating and the Dutch revolt, so her death had very little effect. What it did do, though, was give King Philip II of Spain a reason to attack England. In July 1588, Elizabeth knew that the Spanish Armada was coming. Philip had been plotting against England for years, His first plan of trying to marry Elizabeth failed, his plan of trying to replace Elizabeth with Mary Queen of Scots had failed, and Sir Francis Drake and the other English sea captains were rubbing salt in his wounds by stealing his treasure. He also believed that he needed to help free the English Catholics, but the English Catholics didn't want a Spanish king ruling them any more than the Protestants did. People still remembered the terrible days when Philip had been married to Mary. It was Philip that had encouraged the burnings, not Mary. Now Mary, Queen of Scots, had been executed, he had a cast-iron excuse to march in, dispose Elizabeth, and avenge her death. He planned to send an armada, which is Spanish for large fleet, you're welcome, to put the English navy out of action, so that the Spanish troops could cross the Netherlands in other, smaller ships and conquer England. Philip had planned the Armada for two years and it pained him that Elizabeth was on the throne without him as consort. Not saying that he was in love with Elizabeth, but if she was on the throne, then realistically, if his first plan had worked, he would be ruling it too. And that's what he wanted, the kingdom, not Elizabeth. Philip at this point was 61 and Elizabeth was in her 50s. Soon after departing from Lisbon, Spanish ships had been damaged. Men had diseases and food had gone rotten, all before leaving. They had to stop at Corona in northern Spain for repairs. The commander of the fleet wrote to Philip telling him what had happened and that the men are weak. But Philip wanted the attack to go ahead as planned. They planned on sailing up the channel, meeting with a Netherlands force led by the Duke of Parma in Dunkirk who were to be ferried across in barges to invade Kent. The Armada would protect that fleet as they went on to England. 
It is claimed that Sir Francis Drake stood on Plymouth Hoe playing a game of bowls and when he was interrupted to be informed about the arrival of the Spanish fleet, he said, Time enough to play the game and thrash the Spaniards afterwards. And he was determined to finish his game of bowls before dealing with the Armada. However, this is a lie. He did not play bowls at the arrival of the Armada. All accounts of Drake playing the game were written years after the event. You sit on a throne of lies. Meanwhile, English troops had been gathering at Tilbury in case the Duke of Parma landed from the Netherlands. Elizabeth decided that she would go and meet the men who were going to defend their country. Not everyone thought she should go. They were worried about her safety. What if a Catholic was among the troops? Would they take a shot at her? Elizabeth had long since forgiven Robert Dudley for his marriage to Latisse, and he was now in command of the troops at Tilbury. That was the real reason she was going. The Spaniards now had to make it up the channel. Some of their ships crashed into each other, and an explosion lost them two ships. The navy intercepted the armada in the channel, and Drake took one of the Spanish ships, the Rosario. While at Tilbury, Elizabeth made an infamous speech that would inspire the English for centuries. And it's even used by our lionesses. The story of the Armada and Elizabeth's speech at Tilbury is used to inspire our little island in times of need. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too, and think it foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare invade the borders of my realm, to which rather than any dishonour shall grow by me, I myself will take up arms, I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarded of every one of your virtues. That last bit meant that she would pay the troops? As far as monarchs go, Elizabeth had a better record than many rulers on this. But she didn't pay him, despite saying she would in her speech. In the original story, the Queen's speech starts off the attack. The English set fire to eight ships of their own and launch them towards the Armada. In a panic, they cut rank and some ships collided. Then the wind drove the ships northward and then sailed. But... Yeah, Elizabeth actually made her speech 11 days after the fire ships and after the armada had been won. The men also were sent home as the Queen couldn't afford to pay their wages. They never actually got a chance to fight as the bad weather destroyed most of the armada and the Spanish retreated. Elizabeth had come up with the plan to address the troops with her infamous speech while the Spanish were still in the Channel. Yet by the time she arrived at Tilbury, the Armada were already staring defeat in the face. Eleven days earlier, English fire ships had attacked the Spanish fleet while it was waiting off France for its rendezvous with Palmer's army. These burning vessels caused the Spanish to panic. So, when Elizabeth uttered her famous words at Tilbury, what was left of the Armada was on its way home running up around Scotland and Ireland to get back to Spain, so basically just doing a loop of the uh, UK to turn round. The sources don't even mention the famous heart and stomach of a king line until more than three decades after the event. It was first introduced by a Protestant chaplain who had been at Tilbury. Although it does kind of sound like something that Elizabeth would say. Gales prevented the capture of the Spanish ships, which were driven north, and they limped home round the north of Scotland. Many ships were wrecked, hundreds of Spaniards drowned, and only half the armada returned to Spain. Not a single English ship had been lost or taken. So, basically, we beat the Spanish because of bad weather. Sounds about right. Despite beating the Armada, Elizabeth's ongoing struggle against Spain was costly and unsuccessful, leaving a large debt to her successor. The crown threatened prison for those who were bold enough to claim that they had not been paid. By the end of 1588, more than half of the men who had fought against the Armada 
had died from disease and starvation. The Spanish Armada is often depicted as this invincible navy, but it was tiny, really. There was 103 Spanish ships versus 34 English ships, Elizabeth and some private ships for extra. The Norman invasion fleet of 1066 and the French force that crossed the Channel and sunk the Mary Rose in 1545 had more ships than the Armada. Here in England, we see the Armada story as a great underdog story, a victory against the evil Spain. But the Spanish never really saw the Armada as a significant setback. Elizabeth was too poor to pay those who had fought for their country, and the English Admiral Lord Howard wrote, The sailors cry out for money, and know not when they are paid. I have given them my word and honour that I will see them paid. If I had not done so, they would have run away from Plymouth in their thousands. So what were the consequences of the Spanish Armada? Well, the defeat did not harm Philip's control over his empire, which continued to grow after his death in 1598, and Spain would remain a dominant superpower for a further hundred years. Philip tried other armadas in 1596 and 1597, but both of them, again, were destroyed by bad weather, although I guess more specifically this time storms. England took it as a sign that God was on their side, even celebrating a national day of thanksgiving for its victory over Spain on the 24th of November. Elizabeth's reputation as Gloriana peaked. The Armada also meant that England was able to continue causing trouble for the Spanish Empire and the pirates continued to attack Spanish treasure ships. On the 4th of September 1588, the Queen's favourite and one true love, Robert Dudley, died at Cornbury Park near Oxford. Dudley's health had not been good for some time. Historians have considered malaria and stomach cancer as causes of death, but his death still came unexpectedly. Elizabeth, unsurprisingly, was deeply affected, and locked herself in her apartments for a few days, and refused to speak to anyone until Lord Burley had the door broken. Elizabeth kept the letter he had sent her six days before his death in a bedside treasure box for the rest of her life. It was marked with his last letter in Elizabeth's handwriting. However, don't think for one minute that in her grief, Elizabeth would be kinder to her cousin Latisse. No! Her grief did not make her any more sympathetic to poor Latisse, Robert Dudley's widow. Dudley had died owing the Queen a loss of money, and Elizabeth wanted it back. She made Latisse auction her furniture to pay the debt, as well as taking back a house that she had given Robert. All this, despite the fact that Dudley had left Elizabeth a spectacular necklace of 600 pearls to add to her vast collection of jewels, Elizabeth wore Dudley's necklace for the portrait that was painted to celebrate the English victory over the Armada. Elizabeth was more popular than ever after the Armada, and she had finally earned the respect of her own counsellors. Lord Burley declared, She is the wisest woman that ever was, for she understands the interests and dispositions of all the princes in her time, and is so perfect in the knowledge of her own realm that no counsellor she has can tell her anything she does not know before. Even the new Pope was a fan. She is a great queen, and were she only a Catholic, she would be our dearly beloved daughter. Just look how well she governs. She is only a woman, only mistress of half an island. Rude. And yet she makes herself feared by Spain, by France, by the Empire, by all. I wish I was free to marry her. What children we would have. They would have ruled the world. All right, Pope, calm down. In the November, Elizabeth was still milking the success of the Armada, which had happened in the July, and held a victory parade through London. England and Elizabeth had an inflated ego, so we launched the Counter Armada, also known as the English Armada, real original, in May 1589. Now, I'm going to give my English viewers a heads up, as you know we don't like discussing battles that we lost. So, if you're English, I suggest skipping this section so you don't get triggered or end up having a stroke because you've learnt that we've actually did lose a battle. 
Sir Francis Drake led the counter-attack on Spain with the hopes of finishing the original Spanish Armada once and for all, and to invade Portugal, which was under Spanish rule, and put a Portuguese king on the throne. But the counter-armada failed. The counter-armada suffered twice as much as the Spanish did in the original armada. The victory of the counter-armada was not as important to Philip as the victory of the original armada was to England. The defeat of the counter-armada was downplayed. A defeat our history wants to forget. Drake and his fleet were forced into making a stop at Corona for lack of provisions. A local woman, Maria Pitta, led a fierce resistance against the English navy. Still celebrated as a heroine in Corona, Pitta is said to have killed an English soldier herself, thereby inspiring the town to victory. 15,000 Englishmen and many of the 86 ships were lost. Elizabeth was getting old now, by Tudor standards anyway, and having witnessed the death of Robert Dudley in 1588, she would see the deaths of two other people that were close to her. The next one would be Blanche Perry, Elizabeth's royal servant right from the time Elizabeth was a child. She died blind on the 12th of February 1590, and the next death was on the 6th of April 1590. Elizabeth's spymaster, Sir Francis Walsingham, died. Walsingham had engineered the downfall of Mary Queen of Scots by providing evidence of her treason against Elizabeth. William Cecil, Lord Burley, was also getting on too. He wanted to retire, but Elizabeth wouldn't allow it. But she did allow him to sit down on a stool in her presence. Usually everyone had to stand or kneel when she was in the room. Although I was watching History After Dark the other day, and they were talking about Queen Elizabeth I. And I really like what Dr. Katrina Marchant said. And she's also got a YouTube channel called Reading the Past, which I highly recommend to anybody that loves history. Like, Dr. Kat's videos are chef's kiss. Like, I, I love her. I think she's really funny. And I really respect her work on YouTube as well. So please go support her. Go subscribe. Go watch her videos. But anyway, on History After Dark, she said... <laughs> that Elizabeth preferred to work her council to death rather than execute them. Which I thought was quite funny because actually she's got a fair point there. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. Point in case, Lord Burley. Elizabeth had banned her godson, Sir John Harrington, from court in 1585 for disgracing himself by making rude remarks to her ladies-in-waiting. However, he managed to win back her favour in 1591 by inventing a flushing toilet, which he called an Ajax. Elizabeth travelled to Kelston Hall to try his Ajax and loved it so much she invited him back to London to install his invention in all of her palaces. As a result, Queen Elizabeth I was the first monarch in current Britain to have a flushing toilet. However, it would be another 200 years before the idea caught on. Prior to this, Tudor palaces and great houses had little rooms called jakes. Sorry to any viewers called jake. The waste from the jakes weren't washed away, but instead fell into a pit. With hundreds of people living in a palace, these pits soon filled up. It was actually pretty disgusting. The pits had to be opened. They were then shoveled up and carted away. The smell would hang around for weeks. That's why Tudor monarchs had three or four palaces that they could move around to. Tudors used a communal damp rag for toilet paper, as it could be rinsed and reused. Gross. As always, I am presenting you highbrow history. On the 28th of January 1596, Sir Francis Drake lay dying. The West Indies legend has it that he ordered his magical drum back to England and swore he would return to his homeland. The drum was taken back to Plymouth, where it remains today, and the drum beats out its own warning when the country is in trouble. The drum is said to have rattled when Napoleon Bonaparte was brought to Plymouth after the Battle of Waterloo. It also sounded in 1914 when World War I started. The last time the drum sounded was during the Battle of Dunkirk in World War II. If you would like a video on Sir Francis Drake and his drum, then let me know in the comment section down below.
On the 4th of August 1598, Elizabeth had finally worked her senior adviser, William Cecil, to death, and he passes his political mantle to his son, Robert Cecil. Robert Dudley at this point had been dead for several years, and the Queen was in need of a new favourite. Enter Robert Devereux. Hello there. Dudley's stepson and Letice's son from her first marriage. In 1599, Robert Devereux was a bit of a scoundrel during a period of war, the Nine Years' War to be exact. He failed to defeat his Queen's Irish enemies and would instead make peace without her consent. And he went about knighting people, something he had no right nor power to do. The cheek, the nerve, the gall, the audacity and the gumption. This rightfully enraged Elizabeth. Robert Devereux was also the Earl of Essex and his greatest failure as Lord Lieutenant. Lord Lieutenant is the same as Lieutenant for the American viewers. It's spelled exactly the same, but it's just pronounced as Lieutenant. I think Lieutenant makes sense and that's probably one of the few times I'll actually agree that the American way of doing it is probably better. But he was Lord Lieutenant, so... When I say that, that's what I mean. Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex's greatest failure as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, a post which he talked himself into in 1599, was the Nine Years' War. The Nine Years' War was in its middle stages and no English commander had been successful. More military force was required to defeat the Irish chieftains led by Hugh O'Neill, the Earl of Tyrone, and supplied from Spain and Scotland. Lieutenant Devereux led the largest expeditionary force ever sent to Ireland, 16,000 troops, with orders to put an end to the rebellion. He departed London to the cheers of the Queen's subjects, and it was expected the rebellion would be crushed instantly. But the limits of the Crown's resources and of the Irish campaigning season dictated otherwise. Essex had declared to the Privy Council that he would confront O'Neill in Ulster. Instead, he led his army into southern Ireland, where he fought a series of inconclusive engagements, wasted his money, and dispersed his army into garrisons, while the Irish won two important battles in other parts of the country. Rather than face O'Neill in battle, Essex entered a truce that some considered humiliating to the Crown, and to the detriment of English authority. The Queen herself told Robert that if she had wished to abandon Ireland, it would scarcely have been necessary to send him there. Ooh, burn! In all of his campaigns, Robert Devereux secured the loyalty of his officers by conferring knighthoods, an honour the Queen herself dispensed sparingly, and by the end of his time in Ireland, more than half the knights in England owed their rank to him. The rebels were said to have joked that he never drew sword but to make knights. But his practice of conferring knighthoods could in time enable Essex to challenge the powerful factions of Cecil's command. Robert Devereux had none of the charisma, uniqueness, nerve or talent that his stepfather Robert Dudley did. Nor did he apparently have the brain cells. In September 1599, Robert Devereux burst in on the Queen while she was getting dressed. A breach of protocol and privacy. As Elizabeth got older, it took her four hours a day to get dressed and undressed, so that's two hours on, two hours off. She wore wigs throughout to cover up her ageing face and she wore white, lead, peruse and vinegar on her face, neck and hands. Beeswax and plant dye paste on her lips and her eyes were lined with coal. The young, pretty Elizabeth had aged into a balding, frail woman with black, rotten and foul-smelling teeth, scarred by pox, crippled by headaches and plagued by bouts of depression. Elizabeth's cosmetics were dangerous. The Earl of Essex infamously burst into the Queen's chamber before she was dressed or made up. He was so shocked at her haggard appearance, he joked about her crooked carcass to his friends. 
Upon hearing this, Elizabeth chopped off his head, although to be fair, he did start a rebellion against her as well in 1601. Due to his failure in Ireland and his attempted rebellion to usurp the throne in 1601, Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, was arrested. The Queen's once fondness saved him from being hung, drawn and quartered. Instead, he was beheaded. Both Devereux's mother, Latisse Knowles, and sister, Penelope Rich, appealed for his freedom. But Penelope is said to have written such an arrogance letter that it ruined the appeal to the Queen. Elizabeth expected Robert to plead for his life, but he didn't, and so she signed the death warrant. On the 25th of February 1601, Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, was beheaded in the confines of the Tower of London and buried there in the church of St Peter ad Vincula. At his own request, Essex had a private execution. On the scaffold, he swore he had never wanted the Queen's death, or intended to lead a coup. 1601 is also the year Elizabeth gives her golden speech to Parliament. There is no jewel, be it of never so high a price, which I set before this jewel. I mean your love. Until Henry VIII broke from Rome, Parliament had been an occasional event. Elizabeth had planned to keep it that way. However, tensions grew as the Queen's debts started mounting, thanks to the war in Ulster. Elizabeth treated her parliament to a golden speech, thanking them for their love of her, and she assuring her love to them, which they all bought and she was forgiven. High taxes, bad harvests, unemployment, stagnant wages, inflation and crime created discontent, and Elizabeth's popularity waned. Her golden speech had temporarily renewed her popularity. On the 25th of February 1603, Elizabeth's close friend and cousin, Catherine Carey, Countess of Nottingham, died at Arundel House. This came as a blow to Elizabeth. Catherine had held the post of Lady of the Bedchamber to Elizabeth I until her death, dying only a few weeks before the Queen herself. Elizabeth paid the expenses of the funeral for her cousin. After 46 years on the throne, Queen Elizabeth I died on the 24th of March, 1603, at Richmond Palace. All of Elizabeth's leading councillors and courtiers were agreed at this point that King James VI for Scotland was the rightful heir to the English throne. I mean, not true, but whatever. Robert Cecil had been in secret communication with King James for years, yet Elizabeth herself had never come out and said James was her successor. Now, as she lay dying on her cushions in front of a fire, her counsellors tried for the last time to get an answer from her. Troubled me no more. Who else but my cousin Scotland? It was at last definite. Her counsellors were ready. It was important that James received the news and came to London as quickly as possible to forestall a Catholic coup. Seven strong, fast horses were ready at 50 mile intervals up the Great North Road. Sir Robert Carey, Elizabeth's cousin, dressed for a long, cold ride, sat astride his own horse beneath the window for the Queen's withdrawing room. In the early hours of the morning, his sister Lady Philadelphia Scrope, also Elizabeth's cousin and her lady-in-waiting, appeared at the Queen's bedroom window and silently dropped the sapphire ring from Elizabeth's finger down to him. The Queen had drawn her last breath, Sir Robert caught the ring and was off, riding to Scotland. He covered the 400 miles to Edinburgh in three days. James, King of Scots, was now James, the first of England. Many people speculate this part of the story to be a myth. I have a feeling it might be, but I can say I I enjoy it. I enjoy the theatrical side of this. Queen Elizabeth's funeral was on the 28th of April 1603 and she was buried at Westminster Abbey with her sister Queen Mary I and they share a tomb, probably against both of their wishes. Chronicler John Stowe reported at her funeral, There was such a great general sighing, groaning and weeping as the like hath not seen or known in the memory of man. The lead coffin containing the Queen's body was drawn by four horses decked in black. Covered in purple velvet, there was a life-size effigy on it of the Queen in her robes of state and royal crown. 
Six earls carried a canopy to protect the coffin. Then came the Queen's Master of Horse, leading her favourite palfrey. Many people wept when they saw the familiar horse without its rider. Next, dressed in black, came the chief mourners, led by the Marchioness of Northampton, Helena Snakenborg, slash Parr, Helena Parr. All the ladies of the court and many peeresses of the realms walked behind the coffin, through the streets to Westminster Abbey. Behind them walked 260 poor women, four abreast. It was rumoured that Arbella Stewart, or Arabella Stewart, depending on which version you prefer, was supposed to be the chief mourner. However, she refused to undertake the role and King James had not yet arrived in London. Hence why Helena Parr did it. And I'd like to end this episode on John Stowe's full eyewitness account. Westminster was surcharged with multitudes of all sorts of people in the streets. Houses, windows, leads and gutters that came to see the funeral. And when they beheld her statue lying upon the coffin, there was such a general sighing, groaning and weeping, as the like hath not been seen or known in the memory of man. Neither doth any history mention any people, time or state to make like lamentation for the death of their sovereign. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. If you'd like to watch another of my videos, then may I suggest my video on Elizabeth's parents, King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn? Or what about her predecessor to the throne, Queen Mary I? At this point, I have no idea what we will be exploring next time as I haven't decided. But until then, have a wonderful day.